Hey, 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 we're back again with the MPL Weekly. I'm Becca, that's Paul, and that's Maria. And uh, we're going to jump uh, into a mid-range versus mid-range match next. Looks like Andrew Cuneo is bringing the Bant, Brian Brownduin is bringing the Esper. What do you think about this matchup? I think this one's going to be the close one. This is the close matchup here, taking a look at the players. Yeah, all right. Cuneo, a.k.a. Gainsay. 94. Has been for a while. Wow. Yeah. That, is that Old the school. oldest one so far? Yes, it is. Wow. By a year, I think. And uh, so far in the MPL weekly, the record is 3-0 and for Cuneo. And then Brian Brown doing the master of puns as a 2-1 record for the MPL weekly. He's been playing since 2006. Uh, and let's see, Ooh, top finishes for both players. It's Bant mid-range versus Esper mid-range. What makes a mid-range deck effective? Is it green or is it black? Let's see Cuneo's deck. All right, here we go, Bant mid-range. This has been a popular one last week. There's God Eternal Iketra, which is really one of the cards that makes the deck tick, but only one copy here, Paul. Yeah, and I'm really, uh it's really interesting to see Cuneo choosing to play a band mid-range. Like, he's usually known to be kind of a control player. Right. So you know if he's playing something else that he also thinks control is likely not well positioned. And one interesting thing about this specific build of band mid-range is the two drops. He's playing the Wildgrowth Walker Mer Merfolk Branch Walker package, but often the band mid-range decks have been playing the Grow Chamber Guardian Incubation Druid right. package instead. But Andrew Cuneo wants to make sure that he shores up uh, his matchup against the aggressive decks. So that's kind of what he had there. He had the package, and then of course your powerful three mana planeswalkers and Vivian and Teferi to be able to flash out all your uh, your gigantic creatures. Love this Rivers Rebuke in the sideboard. <laughs> Some yeah. fun dinosaur action there too. Yeah, we like to call that the one of fun of. You know, you, yeah. get, you get these huge board states where at some point you draw Rivers, Rivers Rebuke and uh, that can that can spell the game. And I think specifically here, this matchup, this card could do a lot of work here. Then you also see four copies of Crawl Harpooner, which is four kind of decks with a bunch of flying creatures like Mono Blue Tempo, but uh, I don't think anybody submitted that this week. Speaking of the matchup, Brian Brown to win. With yeah. the Esper mid. Yeah, and we got to see this deck already in action here. We saw Lucas Esper against Carlos Romao playing this. and But none of them had the elite guard mage. Right, and that was kind of that flex slot, right? Yep. This is the, what four mana gold card do you want to play in your deck? It looks like Brian also likes Soar and Vengeful Bloodlord to get a little value back. If your opponents kill your hero, Precinct 1, Detention Mage, or Thief of Sanity, you can get those back. Uh, actually, no Detention Mage in this main. Um, but then he also plays Elite Card Mage, which is really, really good against pretty much any matchup, right? Because, you know, against Control decks, it gives you that threat, it can yep, replace itself, it. and it draws cards. Uh, uh, sorry, and it gains life. A favorite from the last set of meta before War of the Spark, Kaya Orzov Usurper is out. Yeah, and this is a card that we we haven't seen as much uh, no. people play, but Brian actually choosing to ring this here. And you know what? The graveyard of, uh, removal effect is actually pretty useful against the Commander Dreadhorde deck. So Absolutely. that could be a reason why he has it there. It does gain you a little bit of life. And also he has that one copy of Time Wipe, which does a lot of work in the various mid-range Now I'm worried matchups. people are going to start playing Ashiok. <laughs> that is an option. And you know, honestly, if everybody's playing Commander Dreadhorde, being able to remove your opponent's graveyard is huge. So Ashok no, could, could see play for sure. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Brownduin is probably anticipating all those Command the Dread hordes. Yes. Let's see what happens in this matchup. All right, here we go. Andrew Cuneo on the top of your screen. Brian Brownduin on the bottom. Esper midrange versus Bant midrange. And we are off to the races here with Brian Brownduin being on the play. Over to Cuneo. He's got a Lanaware Elves turn one. Yeah. Unfortunately, he doesn't have a dual land to play with that Lanwar Elf, meaning that he won't be able to play Teferi Time Raveler here on turn two. But he will be able to play a Merfolk Branch Walker. But if, for example, he just drew Breeding Pool. If he had that previous turn, yes. he would have been able to play Teferi Time Raveler turn two and bounce that Hero Precinct 1. Hero of Precinct 1, by the way, was the draw for BBD last turn. Pretty good one when you're playing Esper mid-range. There's a Mortify off the top. Yeah, absolutely. And interesting to see what Brian's going to go with here. He All could right, go for... for sanity. Yeah, he could have gone for Thought Erasure there as well, but he's going for the Thief. The Thief demands an answer, I will say that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Kunio's going to run out this Teferi, bounce that Thief of Sanity. We can't let that get out of hand. All right, so here we go, returning the Thief of Sanity to the hand with that Teferi Time Raveler. No well, attack. And one interesting card that I want to talk about here is the Tristani Discordant, which Kunio's choosing to play here. I, uh, in the main deck, sure. and it's actually very strong against Thief of Sanity. Oh, if you yes. steal creatures off of Thief of Sanity, well, Tristani has a trigger. At the end of turn, 
all players gain control of things that they own. Like, this is my card. I paid for this card. I own this card. Right. Well, you get it back if Tristani is in play. Another plus here from Teferi. Replay of the Thief of Sanity. Last turn from Brian Braun doing nets him another token. And here is Tristani discordant <laughs> for Cuneo. And Andrew's going to get aggressive here. He's going to attack with that Merfolk Branchwalker. Brian doesn't really have any great blocks. And he's probably going to wait till he untaps the cast and Mortify to kill that Tristani. Isolated Chapel, the draw for BBD. Ugin hanging out in BBD's hand as well. Yeah. Ultra powerful planeswalker. Definitely. I mean, this is not a bad turn for BBD. I mean, he does have the ability to play Mortify and Thought Erasure this turn. That's going to generate him two tokens off Hero of Precinct 1. He's also going to be able to get in an attack with Thief of Sanity. He might be deciding whether or not he wants to use Thief of Sanity to finish off the Fairy Time Raveler, but I think he'd rather just steal something instead. Yeah. Mortify takes down Tristani. And here come the attacks. Some of our 1-1s one headed for Teferi Time Raveler and Thief of Sanity right at Cuneo. And Cuneo, uh, sorry, Brian basically saying, I am happy to trade my 1-1 one one tokens with your 1-1 one one lifelink tokens oh here. Oh, yes. And here is Thief of Sanity. What does he want? Ooh, Prison, Prison Realm. Prison Realm is huge. Great catch there with the Thief. And here is Thought Erasure to take a peek at Andrew's hand. Another token off that Hero of Precinct 1. Shalai, by the way, in this deck. Very interesting. Yeah, so now he has a choice here. He can take Teferi Time Raveler or Shalai Voice of Plenty. And given that he has a Prison Realm exiled off the Thief of Sanity and also an Ugin, um, it's close. He might just choose to take Teferi because um, Andrew will be able to play it and bounce Thief of Sanity and then just use a removal spell on the Shalai next turn. He can, for example, use Prison Realm, Prison Realm the Shalai, then attack to ferry down. Brian Braun doing here, big choice between Shalai and Teferi Time Raveler. And I will say this matchup is the, the, the this, is, this is what we like to call good old fashioned magic here. We <laughs> yeah. just have two decks playing a bunch of powerful cards. Nobody's doing anything, you know, uh, six mana haymaker type cards. We're just playing some good magic, trying to extract as much value as you can from your cards. Loving it. In the end, the choice is a Teferi Time Ravel that hits the bin off of that Thought Erasure. Here comes Shalai, Voice of Plenty, distributing some Hexproof and Atlanta War Elves. And back over to BBD, who draws his own Teferi Time Raveler here. Yeah, so now, now mm. BBD can just... The fact that we, uh, you know, um, we like to say, like, kind of time walking your opponent, yeah. you give them, an you make them kind of spend an additional turn to recast whatever they had. So, you know, Brian can choose to play Teferi Time Raveler here to just bounce Shalai to make it so that Kunio has to play it again next turn and then, uh, and then attack, and then he'll be able to draw a card. Alternatively, he can just fire off Prison Realm here to deal with that Shalai. Here, so here is Prison Realm taking care of Shalai. By the way, you get a free scry with it, too. So Thief of Sanity. He can use Teferi here to bounce Merfolk Branchwalker. So if he does this, he can actually finish off Teferi and get Ooh, an attack in I with like Thief it. of Sanity. And draw a card. Right. Ooh, nice draw, Elite Guard Mage. Oh no, he won't be able to finish off Teferi here. It'll go down to one if Kunio chooses to chump block the Hero of Precinct 1. Everything coming up roses here for BBD. Two excellent cards in hand, able to finish off that Teferi. Thief of Sanity trigger here. What do you want? How about a Hydroid Crest? Not a bad seems one. Good. Not a bad one. Ooh, a Prison Realm for Cuneo. Yeah, but I imagine at this point, Cuneo just really needs to refill. Probably going to run out this Hydroid Crisis here for five and hope that it sticks. And of yeah. course, we know that's not going to happen as Brian does have Ugin the Ineffable in hand with six mana. Excuse me, his name is Eugene. Oh, sorry, Eugene. <laughs> Eugenius. <laughs> That's literally how it's spelled. Eugene, I don't understand. Oh. All right, here comes Hydroid Crassus, just as you said. Gaining life, drawing some cards, 5-5 five, five Flyer, Breeding Pool, an additional land into play, and there's a second Elite Guard Mage. Yeah, so you... <laughs> wow, you just messed me up. <laughs> My mission is accomplished. Ugin, Ugin is likely going to see play here. We're going to use that to get the crisis off the battlefield, and then we're gonna get in another hit with Thief of Sanity. So Brian 
kind of just piling on the card advantage here, probably keeping the tokens back to protect his Planeswalkers. And keeping three back makes sense because that way if Kunio even has one removal spell, he still will have two creatures back to block and save that Ugin <coughs> from, uh, from being killed. Now it's in your head, Paul. Uh, you are, you are definitely in, in my head. head. Deputy of Detention is what uh, BBD finds off of that Thief of Sanity. So excellent cards to cast in there, should he ever want to. Okay, so not bad here for Kunio. He just drew Teferi Time Raveler with the Prison Realm. So... Oh, never mind. He's going to go with the Krasis here, but he could have used Teferi and Prison Realm to get rid of both of the tokens, which would have then allowed him to kill, uh, kill Ugin. And this is interesting, too. Like, he's just keeping the pressure on, too, with these, with these giant Krasis. Like, well, you need to deal with this if you want to do anything. Definitely. And there's a plus from Ugin, exiling that card down, essentially kind of as a morph, and it's a thought erasure. So if it ever dies, that 2-2 ever dies, it's going to go right back to BBD's hand. And BBD choosing to play out Elite Garbage, but keep in mind, he does have a Deputy of Detention here, which you can use to remove the Hydra Crisis. And here comes Deputy of Detention. All the, look at all these tokens. This is, this is just like a huge army that Brian has been able to assemble here and just really putting on a masterclass of what Esper Midrange wants to do when it's doing its thing. Oh, God. Probably don't want to take Tristani, I'm going to say. No, I don't we've, think we've so. Stolen, <laughs> we've stolen some things. Don't want to give it back. Uh, we yeah. don't need to get caught for what okay, we've done. Okay, I guess BBD saw that line. <laughs> so he's going to get another Crassus in hand. So two at the ready. Yeah, and at this point, uh, Brian's board is just far too overwhelming. And uh, yeah, th this one is also basically just over here. Deputy of Detention, by the way, one of the best answers to Hydrate Crassus. Right, because even if he killed the Deputy of Detention, the Crassus will come back into play as a 0 0. Won't be doing a whole lot. I also like Hostage Taker. Oh That's yeah. my personal favorite. Absolutely. Kunio here continuing to fight the good fight to Fairy Time Raveler to return Prison Realm back to his hand and Shalai back to the battlefield. Yeah, but at this point, if Brian just. Right click attack. Oh, sorry, we don't have to right click anymore. Yeah, yeah. He can just attack with all. He also has Teferi on three, which you can use to bounce the Shalai. And replaying the Prison Realm that he just stole back. Gets a Scry. Targets, I think, Teferi. Yeah, it looks like it's Teferi. And, I mean, Brian does. I mean, I think Brian can just attack with everything here. But uh, Shalai is doing a good job of. I mean, Shalai can potentially just eat the Thief of Sanity here. But Brian simply just has way too many threats on the battlefield here. All right, back over to BBD, draws a godless sh shrine for the turn. Ugin in play, two Hydride Crisis that he can cast if he wants to, including an elite guard mage, and just a mess of tokens. By the way, Kunio's life total, 10. Yeah, so we're looking at five, six, seven, eight. There's 10 creatures on the battlefield for BBD. So if he just attacks with everything, Kunio would go down to seven, even if he blocks three of the biggest creatures on the battlefield. But in, in this case, do you just want to hold out, play a Crassus, and be like, go? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. He can play a Crassus for six, which would allow him to draw three cards, gain three life, put a 6-6 six, six in play, and also take up Ugin. Because yep. because of that Ugin with the Hero Precinct 1, he's just putting so much more pressure on the battlefield than Kunio is able to. Gives him a chance to protect that Ugin, too, because with each tick up is another chance for it to tick back down and kill something that Kunio's got going on. Right, so for this turn, Brian will be able to put basically three creatures in play, right? He's got the Crassus, he's got the 1-1 one, one generator from Hero Precinct 1, and the 2-2 two, two from the Ugin. On the following turn, he will then have Ugin at three, which will then give him the ability to minus it yep. to also clear the way and kill that Shalai. Hydroid Crassus for six here, Hero of Precinct 1 trigger. Gains life up to 18, draws three cards, all three are lands, plus Ugin. Hiding a Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, I wonder if Brian is going to just not attack and wait next turn yeah. to be able to get in a big attack. Doesn't have to worry about that River's Rebuke until, no. uh, until a sideboard <laughs> But think games. of this right now. Imagine yeah. if he had it. <laughs> He's like, you know what? Screw this. I'm attack not waiting. with everything. I don't really care if I lose anything. You're going to go down to three here no matter what. Even if I lose three creatures, it's totally fine. So this, this attack makes sense because, um, you know, Brian still has enough blockers here to be able to, you know, not die from an attack back potentially here from Shalai with the other creatures. 
And a lot of times I find myself being a little too precious with my creatures and the board that I've created. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't have, you know, they have some profitable blocks, but look at this here. He's just right. like, who cares? I'm putting you down to low life total. Next turn, I'm going to slam the door shut. Yeah, and I will say, that, like, moments like this, this is kind of, in my opinion, what, help, what like, separates the, you know, from, like, the decent players to the world-class players. Because, yes, oftentimes decent players will look at this board state and be like, well, you know, I might not have a great attack. I mean, this one's a little more obvious. Yeah. But there are situations that are close like this. Sure. Where players go, you know what, I don't think I have a good attack. But the but the truly world-class players really understand that, like, they need to make attacks where sometimes you're going to lose some creatures to really just put yourself in positions to win or just, just make it so that, you know, you just c clean up the board a little bit. So Cunio falls to one after that giant attack from Brian Brondouin. Seeing if there's anything that he can do to claw his way back out of this hole that he's found himself in, where it's just him and one point of life. Wild Growth Walker is a way to help a little bit here. Yeah, he's got Wild Growth Walker into Jaylight Ranger, which means he will go up to seven. He's going to have a couple of extra creatures in play, but it's just still not going to be enough here. I mean, even if he Prison Realms the biggest threat, if he Prison Realms the Hydra Crisis, I mean, Ugin will still eat the Shalai, yep. and Brian will have more than enough creatures here to attack for lethal. Here comes Prison Realm on the Hydroid Crassus. Scry one, doesn't matter. To the bottom. And Brian's board is about ready and set to overwhelm Cuneo next turn. Cuneo still keeping it tight here. Ticking up that Teferi. Oh yeah, I you like know. it. I Don't like it. Don't miss anything. Practice like you play. Oh, and you know what? This makes sense. Attacking Shalai into Ugin because Ugin was probably going to kill the Shalai next turn. So what, what do we have here? We have nine creatures in play. Oh, actually, we have nine creatures. We have five tokens and four creatures in play. This is not lethal <laughs> yet. Cuneo would go down to one okay. here. Okay. And I mean, there's some good stuff. There's some goodies under those tutus that, uh, that BBD probably isn't too, too worried if they die. Right. But keep in mind, BBD has another Crassus here that he can play for seven. Getting that 7-7 seven, seven in play. Uh, if he wants to play it slower, he can choose to attack with just a Guard Mage. But I think he's probably just attacking with everything because he can't, you can't actually lose here. Like, you're not giving anything relevant back here with that Deputy of Detention. No. And he does want those two twos to die because he has a Teferi underneath one of them. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> Brian Brondouin takes down game number one here versus Andrew Cuneo. Let's take a peek at Cuneo's sideboard decisions. Yeah, so this is where it gets really interesting. I'm excited to see what he's going to look to do here. I think Baffling End is a reasonable choice here uh, to deal with the Thief of Sanity and the Hero of Precinct 1. He absolutely needs to have answers to those cards. Adding in some Disdainful Strokes and some Crow Harpooners. Yeah, Harpooner is an excellent answer also to Thief of Sanity. It has reach for future thieves if you, if you just play it early. At the same time, it just cleanly uh, fights and kills Thief of Sanity. Reach for future thieves. I like that. <laughs> I'm just always thinking about it so reactively. Like, right. well, of course they've already played it against <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it still has reach, so you can still block. Vi uh, Vivian also yeah, that's decent true. at... at uh, giving your creature some protection. And then on Brian's side here, we see Time Wipe, which is going to be Ooh. really, really strong here. And he also brought in the Elder Spell, recognizing that Vivian yep. uh, is a problematic card in this matchup. So having Elder Spell is a nice way to deal with Planeswalkers. And you can- uh, Sometimes you only have to kill one. Right, or sometimes you put all the counters on Teferi and just win the game that way. Absolutely. So yeah, and it looks like he's replacing Elite Guard Mage here because I mean, four mana, two, three flyer that draws Shall you a card I is okay. <laughs> But he's thinking that Hostage Taker is, is much better in this spot. Absolutely. All right, sideboard decisions done here. Game number two, BBD currently up a game, as you can see there on your screen, over Andrew Cuneo. And let's take a look at BBD's opening hand here, Teferi and D-Spark. Yeah, this is probably a mulligan. Um, he just doesn't have enough going early. And Dispark doesn't care until okay. later. Oh, he's going to keep it. All right, he's on the draw, so, you know, maybe he, fi he he strings some threads together. I mean, the games do go along, so having a bunch of lands makes it more reasonable. But I thought he wanted to kind of get off with an early start, get that Thought Erasure into Thief of Sanity going. But Thought Erasure, of course, a very Great big draw. draw. Yeah. 
And he's going to fire it off here. Soar in the draw for this turn. Let's take a look. What is he taking from Cuneo? He's going to take that Vivian Reed here, most likely. Huge threat out of the way from Cuneo and Hero <laughs> Precinct one Look on at top. This. Look, just curving perfectly. PVD. Body Razor into Hero Precinct one into Soren Vengeful Bloodlord. So. Wow, I got to learn how to keep like Brian. You just ha you just have to, to feel it, you know. You oh, just have to okay. know it's going to be on top. Okay. Yeah. No big deal. All right. Merfolk Branchwalker here for Andrew. Going exploring finds a Crassus. Not bad. But no blue source, no blue. So, so binning that. And he's probably just running out the, the Harpooner here just to be more aggressive. Yeah, sometimes you just need a 3-2. Sometimes you just got to beat down. Speaking of beating down, here's Hero of Precinct 1 for Brian. Back over to Andrew, who still can't find that blue source, Temple Garden. He's not going to cast that Teferi or that Deputy of Detention. Yeah, really needed to find that blue source, because imagine if you played that Deputy of Detention here on the Hero of Precinct 1, BBD wouldn't so have had ahead. a very good play next turn. Land number four for BBD is going to be Soren, Vengeful Bloodlord here. By the way, that one damage only deals to uh, players or planeswalkers, can't hit creatures. But it does gain you that life, which which is big. And Andrew really wanted a blue source there. He wanted that Deputy of Detention, so now just has to turn his creature sideways and try to get that Soren. But BBD happy trading their Hero Priest in one because keep in mind Soren, Soren can just bring it back. Right, Soren can bring it back. It's sitting at three loyalty, minus two, get back Hero Precinct one, and follow that up with Teferi Hero of Dominaria this turn. Ooh, seems nice. Here we go, the minus on Soren. Gonna bring back Hero of Precinct one. I love this ability too because you don't even have to pay for it. It just comes right back to the battlefield, and we're gonna get a trigger. Yeah, very, very powerful inclusion. Um, that we've seen some of the Esper mid-range decks yeah. players choose to uh, to bring to this week. And very flavorful. I love it. He brings them back and they're vampires. Yeah. <laughs> so Teferi here of Dominaria plus one here draws a card. <sighs> and and Jeez. And Cunio really needed blue sources. I mean, th these are just the worst possible draws. Just and, and if Forest or Temple Garden just don't do anything here. And now, I mean, BBD is going to start running away with the game with that Teferi ticking up every single turn. You know, along with, you know, Hero Precinct 1 generating more blockers, too. So four is the draw, as you said, for Cuneo. Not what he wanted to see. He does have some attackers, but Brian's blocks aren't terrible. <laughs> and two Planeswalkers in play and a D-Spark at the ready. Yeah, I wonder if Cuneo is even choosing to attack here. It looks like he passed. Yep. No attacks there from Andrew. Over to Brian. So now, n now we play the Teferi game. I mean, yep. you know, anytime you play a Teferi, you kind of cross your fingers and go, okay, please, just don't die. Yep. <laughs> Stay on the battlefield. Let me just start, you know, drawing extra cards every turn. And, you know, usually that's going to be good enough here. So at this point, BBD is just now going to just sit back and try to protect that Teferi as to the best of his abilities to just get it so that it can continue providing him a card advantage. I mean, the pressure that Andrew's starting to build up here is a thing, though, and those two cards in hand aren't doing anything. Well, and that was big. He found oh, the breeding is. pool here for Deputy of Detention, and he's going to fire that off on Teferi here of Dominaria here, right? Teferi Time Raveler is going to be what it is. Okay. Thank me later. Thank me later. <laughs> I'll thank you right now. Thank you very much. Interesting. So he went with Teferi Time Raveler here. So if he chooses to bounce Hero Precinct 1, can he remove Teferi? I don't think so, because Brian has access to those two jump blockers. All right, so we're going to bounce Hero of Precinct 1, find a land off of that draw from Little T. And we're going to... Oh, a Merfolk Branch Rocker and the Crawl Harpooner both at Soren. Including the Llanowar Elves. It's like, I'm ready to trade that, and uh, Brian at this point just wanting to preserve that Soren. Okay, so so now we're in a situation where um, Brian has that Teferi in play, which he's going to tick up. But now, I mean, Cuneo has a nice board, and he still has the ability to use Deputy of Detention to get that Teferi off the battlefield. Two Hero of Precinct 1s in hand for Brian Braun doing two here. A new one off the draw and the one that was bounced. Okay, so Brian is actually ha has a decision here. He can cast Elder Spell, kill Teferi Time Raveler, and then emblem his own Teferi in play. All right, I like that, it. That is something that we, he can do. We've seen that already. 
is does he have any, he doesn't have anything in his graveyard. He could also choose to um, eat the Soren to keep Teferi Hero of Dominaria in play, and that is all. That yeah, that is also an option. And then he can play two pre Hero Precinct ones as well. I don't know. Is that good here? He's thinking about I it. I mean, if you can survive for that one turn, it will get you there. And he has had a pretty comfortable life total. But, you know, having basically emblem of every single turn, I draw a card, I get to exile one of your permanents, is extremely powerful. But he didn't... Well, he didn't go, yeah. he didn't go whole hog here, but yeah. we went hog enough. <laughs> 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 I'm ashamed at what I've just said. But here's the emblem for Teferi. Soren ticks up, deals one. And we can play out a uh, hero of uh, Precinct 1, make that two. All right, so we've got the emblem in play. We have the emblem in play, but I mean, is that uh, Kuni, Kuni? That was a huge draw from Kuni. He drew Tristani Ooh. this court, and that's a lot of pressure. Also, I mean, this turn, he's just going to play out this Deputy of Detention. Does he have mana to play Tristani as well? He does. So what he can do now is remove both of the Hero of Precinct 1s and attack down that Soar and Vengeful Bloodlord. <laughs> And this is a lot of damage here. Wow. I mean, could, this might just be way too many permanents for Teferi's Emblem to actually be relevant enough. Oh, this is so interesting. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody win through a Teferi Emblem. Yeah, this this is incredible. I mean, you, you know, there could have been something said to maybe potentially just playing out one Hero of Precinct 1 and keeping up D-Spark in case something like this happened. Merfolk Branchwalker is going to be going at Soar and Vengeful Bloodlord, Jade Light Ranger, and the Crawl Harpooner at BBD's face, knocking him down to 10. Oh my god, w this would be an ex incredible turnaround. All right, here we go. To Fairy's Emblem, deals with the Deputy, gets back the two heroes of Precinct 1. Thief of Sanity is the draw. Yeah, okay, well... I think, I think BBD really needed to find like, a gold spell here, just to kind of... Uh, yeah. survive over the next few turns, but I think he's going to be okay now because he drew that Thief of Sanity, that got him two more tokens, and then he's got a D-Spark here for that Tristani Discordant, which will then, then generate two more tokens on top of <gasps> wow, that. Wow, this and game has been in, awesome. <laughs> right, and keep in mind, Teferi Emblem is still ticking every single turn. All right, back over to Andrew here. Hydroid Crest. What is happening? <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> wow, what a draw for Kunio here. So now Kunio can... Play a Hydroid Crassus for six, draw three more cards this turn. Let's find out what he does, in what order he does it. Brian Brondewin, of course, not aware of that Crassus that Andrew has just drawn this turn. D-Spark in hand, ready for Tristani Discordant, but not really ready for that Crassus. Yeah, I mean, Kunio does have to be mindful of the fact that BBD might have a removal spell here. At the same time, Teferi Emblem is ticking. He might be in one of those situations where he can't really afford to play around removal, right? right. It's like, if you got it, you got it. I got to put myself in the best position to win. I'm going to attack with everything, but here it is. D-Spark targets Tristani Discordant, makes two more tokens off the heroes of Precinct 1. Away goes Tristani, and here's the attack, which now looks, I don't know, a bit worse. <laughs> a lot worse. <laughs> I mean, these tokens are going to basically eat every single Sick. creature in play. <laughs> BBD is going to... Oh, even chumping the branch walker, he's like, you know what? I don't want to take any damage. He's going to eat everything, and at the end of this, Kunio is just going to have a branch walker. Meanwhile, BBD is going to have all three of the relevant permanents with Teferi Emblem still going. But how about this? Hydroid Crassus. Giant Flyer. Giant Dead Flyer. Bye. <laughs> yeah. that, that's gone. And now BBD can start attacking here. He's probably not chump blocking with Hero Precinct 1, so I imagine he's just likely going to attack with everything here. Hovering over the next to combat button, and sure enough, well, one Hero of Precinct 1 is going to swing in. Okay. Does he find a gold spell? No. Lanawar Elves is what he finds off the Thief of Sanity. Might as well cast it. Over to Cuneo. Cuneo fighting the good fight here. <laughs> For real. Trying his best to through fight, this emblem. fight through that Teferi emblem. And we got Vivian here trying to find something. I love new Vivian, by the way. Let's take a look at what Ooh. she finds. Oh, those were all misses. You, I was like, yeah, those are all good cards. You but can't get those. Up. She's not that good, sadly. Right. Keep in mind, Vivian is not just minus two. Look at the top three. Put a card <laughs> in your hand. It's uh, put a creature. Another Thief of Sanity here for Brian Braun doing Teferi's Emblem going to go off, <laughs> targeting Vivian, Champion of the Wilds. But we get to flash in a Deputy of Detention, which is pretty fun. 
Yeah, and if you notice the timing on that, he he didn't choose to just fire up that deputy of detention right away. He wanted that draw trigger to happen first on the Teferi, then play out that deputy of detention with Flash because of the Vivian in play. Thief of Sanity here is going to pick up a Merfolk Branch Walker. Yeah. Again, don't want to steal those Tristanis. Oh, no. Down comes the Branch Walker on an explore mission here for Brian Frondoon. Finds a Glacial Fortress. Second Thief of Sanity comes out. Whew. Crassus? Nope. Nope, just some lands. And Andrew Cuneo is going to pack it in there. And that is Brian Brondoon. Victorious, two games to zero. Oh, wow, that was exciting there. For a moment, we thought maybe Kuno could be the first person ever in all of history to beat a Teferi <laughs> Emblem. Okay, it's probably been done, but I, mean, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I mean, that looked a lot closer really than I did. think it should have been, right? <laughs> yes, I, mean, I agree. The entire course of that game, Brian was just firmly in the lead, you know? He wasn't stalled on lands, he was playing things every single turn and just doing all the things his deck was created to do, but, I mean, Kunio, credit to him for really putting up a pretty good fight there, despite being kind of stuck uh, without blue mana for a while. Yeah, that was awesome, Paul. I, I, I was hoping for him, I was pulling for him, but in the end, just couldn't get there. Because right. everybody loves the good underdog story to see that one would have been incredible, but Brian Brownduin is a, such a fantastic player. So that yeah. was really cool to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of those things where this is where you see kind of um, the kind of the separation in what happens in this specific matchup, right? Because you have the Bant mid-range deck and then you have the Esper mid-range deck. But the problem, the thing is the Esper mid-range deck has two cards, two creatures that really need to be answered, to, to be dealt with right away. And that's Hero Precinct 1 and Thief of Sanity. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the Bant mid-range deck just doesn't have a lot of removal spells. Those colors just don't lend themselves towards you know having solid spot removal spells. Whereas when you're the Esper deck, yeah, you're kind of playing the same game, except yeah, if there's something I need to kill, I have the answers, but you don't. Right, exactly. Well, we'll see if Kunio comes back with that Bant mid-range again next week. But now we're gonna look at the Dreadhorde versus Dreadhorde match we've all been waiting for. This is Efro, Eric Froelich against Javier Dominguez. Both players have been playing a while. Froelich since 94, Dominguez since 01. And uh, Froelich's got a slightly better record here in our weekly we've been doing. Uh, great top finishes. And we have the Sultai Dreadhorde versus the Four Color. I wonder what that splash of white does differently in Dominguez's deck. So let's see the Sultai. So this is really interesting stuff here, Paul. And which person has brought the more ideas ideal version of this really, really exciting new deck. Yeah, I think there are certain advantages. There's uh, there are advantages to playing either combination. Sure. Uh, Eric choosing choosing to go with the Sultai version, which allows him to play basic lands, so you can't just get cheesed by Assassin's Trophies and what have you. But he's also he also gets to play a few additional cards because he doesn't play them with the White Splash. He gets to play the very powerful Nissa who shakes the world, who's extremely powerful at dealing with Planeswalkers. You slam Nissa, you turn your land into threats, and then you just start attacking all the various Planeswalkers your opponent can have. On top of that, it works really well with Hydra Crassus because yep. now you get all that additional mana from this is pass uh, the static ability to be able to pump all that mana into the Hydra Crisis. And there's another command, the Dreadhorde, in the sideboard for Eric Froelich. And just for people who might not be familiar with this deck, how does it work? So basically what you're looking to do is play your typical Sultai mid-range strategy, you play your Wild Growth Walkers and your Explorer Creatures, trade, trade, trade. If you don't win that way, you got plan B, or maybe it's plan A at this point. I you think it's plan A. The Dreadhorde. <laughs> so once everything dies and everything is in the graveyard, then you can play Command the Dreadhorde for any number of creatures that are on your opponent's graveyard or your graveyard. And it works really, really well with the Wild Growth Walker package because now you can command the Dreadhorde, get back Wild Growth Walker, a bunch of Explorer creatures, gain all that life back, meaning that it any future command the Dreadhorde you draw, you can cast it again and again and again. And you can do that because of cards like Tamio. And here's Javier Dominguez with the four color version. So in here you get access to Teferi, both Teferis in fact. So this is, you know, which, which version is better? I can't say. It's nice to have Teferi, though, I, I gotta say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Teferi is just, like, the reason... Many decks have really stretched their mana to play Teferi, and this deck is doing exactly the same thing. It's going, you know what? I I'm gonna play four copies of Interplanar Beacon to be able to cast all these spells so that I could get Teferi in play. But if you notice, very similar thing. Wild Growth Walker package along with Command the Dreadhorde with Tamiyo to kind of name Command the Dreadhorde if you need to find it or get back whatever threat you might need. So the advantages of playing this is of course having access to those very powerful uh, white splashes with the Teferis. 
Taking a look here at Javier's sideboard too, we got a couple of Lilianas in here, two Elder Spells, which, you know, we haven't really seen it do like so much killing of Planeswalkers, but in this matchup specifically, it could kill five, it could kill four, it could be a very high number. <laughs> I mean, so far what we've seen from the Elder Spell is helping you emblem your emblem Teferi. Emblem your Teferi, right? yeah. And in this matchup, only Javier has the ability to do that, but uh, I mean, yeah. Elder Spell is just a very, very efficient spell, right? It's a two, anything that's just two mana, the short target Planeswalker, that's already just a good enough card that you want to play in your deck. But at the same time, you can just randomly win games with some of your old, you know, five mana Planeswalkers with those very, very powerful ultimate effects. Well, let's hope Javier doesn't get caught on his mana and choke there. Let's see what this uh, Dreadhorde versus Dreadhorde game looks like. Well, I'm so excited for this, Paul. I said it at the top of the show. This is my deck in standard right now, and it is awesome. I'm not going to pull any punches. It is so fun and so silly. I haven't played Efro's version, though, so I'm super excited to see how it does against the four-color version. And like you said, the mana is stretched, but you've got stuff like Interplanar Beacon in Javier's hand. Right, and mana not really a huge issue in this matchup because there's no Field of Ruin or Assassin's Trophy or anything like that. So it just really comes down to, you know, what are the more important cards in the matchup? Is Teferi, the, co the Teferi package, strong, uh, wor better or worse than having the combination of Nyssa and Hydra Crassus? Because those are the two big differences between the decks. So players developing things here as they want to at the start of the game. A couple of Merfolk branch walkers. By the way, Javier left that command, the Dreadhorde, on top of the library, despite being a few miles from casting it at this point. Well, he knew oh, he here was going to two lands off Jedi yeah. Ranger, so that's how that works. <laughs> he also had Bond of Flourishing in hand, which a lot of people have questioned of being a part of the deck, but it does help you to find your lands when you need it. Right. And, and even the life gain. You know, yeah. we've seen play players play the card Revitalize before, where it's gain three life, draw a card. It's basically the same thing here as well. So Nissa, who shakes the world, shaking the battlefield here for Efro, animating that Hinterland Harbor, giving it haste, essentially, and uh, being able to untap and attack. Yeah, and Nissa looking really, really strong here. And the thing is, I mean, graveyards graveyards aren't especially loaded right now. And Javier here can play Tamiyo to try to, like, put a bunch of permanents into the graveyard to try to get that Commander Dreadhord into play. But, I mean, it's possible Eric just kind of ends this game pretty soon. I mean, Nissa is a huge clock. This is a 3-3. Next turn, that's another 3-3. And Eric's going to be able to follow that up with a gigantic Hydra Crassus as well. So Tamiyo here plus... Didn't find what it was looking for, but then again, it's very rare to hit off of Tamiyo. You're really just trying to fill your graveyard so you can minus her and find something else next turn. Exactly. Back over to Eric Froelich here. Nissa, who shakes the world, really going to be the fulcrum on which this game kind of turns, I would say. Yeah, I imagine Eric is going to... Well, this is actually interesting. I mean, uh, you know, Eric, Eric is probably going to be tapping his forests, which is the over, overgrown tomb and the breeding pool. If you notice, only two mana was tapped because Nissa. anytime you tap a forest for mana, you add an additional green. That also counts with overgrown tomb and breeding pool. Tamio here naming command the Dreadhorde. Ifro unable to find some, but fills up his graveyard. All right, here comes another 3-3 three, three from Nissa. Keep in mind, these lands have vigilance, so Eric can choose to attack with these lands and then still use the mana from the lands to play a big Hydro Crassus this turn. Javier here looks like he's interested in protecting Tamio, chump blocking with this Jade Light Ranger. You are setting a bad example. <laughs> setting a bad example. Tamio down to three after that attack. And just like you said, here's a big Hydro Crassus. Yeah, this is going to be a 5-5 five, five Hydro Crassus. So, I mean, this is so much pressure. And, you know, it... it Eric, I mean, it looks like he has a pretty solid build for this matchup. Nissa doing a lot of work here, and also the Crassus. You know what's interesting is Javier's deck doesn't really have any permanent ways to deal with anything. Right. Like, all we're doing is bouncing stuff with Teferi Hero of Dominaria, Teferi Ta Time Raveler. We're not actually killing things. I guess we've got Massacre Girl, but... Yeah, no and hard you, removal. And if you think about it, Teferi Time Raveler is not especially strong in this matchup. Both decks are basically tap-out decks, so that static ability doesn't do anything. And all the creatures are value creatures, right? They come into play and explore or something to that extent. So Teferi Time Raveler, I mean, it's a four of, but I mean, in this head-to-head, -head, it doesn't look all that strong. Javier, having a look at Efro's graveyard, which is pretty important in this matchup, obviously. Considering what he might want to plus his Tamio on, there's always a chance you could hit. Once I plus her and named Command the Dreadhorde, and I got two. Ooh, I've never hit two off of that yet. 
It was a good day. It must be a nice feeling. It was a good day. I mean, to be fair, you don't really need the second one. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> so it looks like he's going to go with Command the Dreadhorde here. Don't think you need another Command the Dreadhorde because you already have one in hand. Wild Growth Walker was the decision in the end. Which makes sense. Yeah, very curious. I mean, all Javier wants to do is try to like protect his life total as much as he can. So I could see something like Merfolk Branch Walker into Teferi Time Raveler to bounce something. And uh, on the flip side, Eric might just be interested in not even attacking the Planeswalkers here because he knows about the Command the Dreadhorde and just getting Javier's life total low enough where Command the Dreadhorde won't be that important, won't be that relevant. So Teferi Time Raveler comes down minuses on that Hydroid Crest as sending it back to Ephro's hand. Branchwalker explored that Tamiyo into the yard as well. Ephro naming something here. What is it? Command the Dreadhorde. So he was trying to find his own Command the Dreadhorde here, but did not get there. Yeah, he hasn't found it yet. It's notable that Frolic has one fewer copy of Command the Dreadhorde in his main deck than uh, Javier, which has the full four. So hard to tell exactly what car so yeah, Eric now looking taking a look at Cyborg here. Oh, sorry, at the graveyard to seeing what exactly things what's the worst ca case scenario here with that command the dreadhorde that Javier could cast. And both players taking peeks in each other's graveyards. This this matchup is, is a little bit of a brain breaker sometimes. Oh here. yeah, I mean there's a lot of math involved and keep in mind this is pro this is the key turn in this specific game. It's you know Eric just really needs to figure out what the worst case scenario here is with Commander Dreadhorde, how he wants to spend his mana. He's got the Crassus and the J Light Ranger. Just wants to make sure because if he messes up this turn, that could cost him the game. Hydroid Crassus hovering above the battlefield, ready to be cast by Eric. So he's got currently four forests in play, so that gives him eleven mana total. So he has he can potentially play one for nine. Let's see what he actually chooses here. It's a five five. Okay. Five five hydroid crass. It sits at the table. Still has mana left over for J Light Ranger if he wants. And the part of the reason why he chose to do this is this still sets him up in a position to draw Command the Dreadhorde. And if he did draw Command the Dreadhorde off the Crassus here, he still has mana here because he hasn't activated Nissa yet to tap Overgrown Tomb for two, Land Warrels for one, Hinterland Harbor for one, untap one of his forests, and then again generate oh, that mana great. to class Command the Dreadhorde. So some excellent play here from Eric Froelich, who is no stranger to such thing, of course. More peaks in the graveyards. Yeah, deciding what to do. And, and, and you know, at, 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 and on the flip side of things, Javier just going, okay, please, just, yeah. I just want to untap, <laughs> man. I just, just let me untap, please. Okay, so Nissa here making another 3-3, three, three, big attack, untaps the breeding pool. Branchwalker here trying to trade with one of these lands. And, and you know what Javier really wants to do? He wants to mill a Wild Growth Walker with that Tamiyo. So if anything, he doesn't want to name Wild Growth Walker. He wants to just name whatever other card that he might be looking for to get that Wild Growth Walker in the graveyard. So when he casts Command the Dreadhorde, um, it'll come into play and gain, gain him a bunch of life. Yeah, if you don't have the Wild Growth Walker thing going on, Command the Dreadhorde doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, by the way, with Teferi Time Raveler in play, you can cast that Command to Dreadhorde at instant, instant speed. speed. However, if you do, you do not get to use the Planeswalkers that you return uh, right away. Big turn here for Javier Dominguez. There's a look at Command the Dreadhorde on the left side of your screen there. It's a lot of Jade Light Rangers, a lot of Explorer <laughs> yeah. cards. So if he, you know... Uh, there's oh, there oh, there's is already, one. Okay, there's so one. there's already one Wild Growth Walker, which is huge. And Javier now just thinking what else he wants to do here with the Tamiya. Let's, take a, let's figure out what he names here. Just names Command the Dreadhorde. Okay, hits no Wild Growth Walkers. He's going to go to 11 here, so there's, only, there's really a limit to how many things he can get back here. It's likely going to be Wild Growth Walker and some of the Explore creatures. Yeah, you've got to do your math right here, okay? Don't be like me the other day and do it wrong. 
<laughs> oh, did you kill yourself? I did. <laughs> mm, yeah, definitely don't want to do that I one. misclicked. I <laughs> thought I hadn't selected something. We'll go with misclick. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I swear. <laughs> you know what's funny, too, is imagining this deck playing out in real life, I think being just like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So difficult. Yeah, no, I mean, sometimes it's just easy mode and you just cruise It's uh, you just cruise through, but other times you see situations like this where it's so extremely close, where you are being pressured and you really need to get the right mix of cards. So Javier here, considering playing this Dreadheart at instant speed. Yep, that's what he's going to go for because he doesn't have any plans here to return any of the Planeswalkers. I think very likely to get back Wild Growth Walker, of course, Yep. and some number of Explorer creatures because he will gain all that life back. Back over to Eric Froelich. Deciding is... I'm not sure if this is a Tamiyo activation and he's taking the peek. Yeah, he, he could also consider using the minus ability. Depends on what he has in his graveyard. Let's take a look. Yeah, by the way, Tamiyo doesn't just dump things into your graveyard. She recurs oh, them, too. That, that, oh, no, no, that, that wouldn't necessarily work. I was thinking maybe he could get back a cast down and then use that in response to all the explore triggers. But, of course, Teferi Time Raveler static says yep. uh, you can only play spells as if they were sorceries. So Wow, a lot of stuff to keep in mind here. <laughs> all right. Here we go. <laughs> Let's command some Dread Hordes, Massacre Girl. Okay. What do we want here? Wild Growth Walker. Great. So that's seven damage. That's seven. Massacre Girl. Interesting. So will this be able to clear the entire board? I mean, putting Massacre Girl into the equation is, <laughs> is making things relatively crazy right now. Right. Yeah, and that's what he's going with. Keep in mind, you can stack the triggers on Merfolk Branch Walker and the Wild Growth Walker so that um, the Massacre Girl's effect resolves before the Merfolk Branch Walkers in guaranteeing that your Merfolk Branch Walker will die. But of course, there's our Land War Elf in place, so it doesn't really matter. So Javier is going to go up to five here. Up to five. Massacre All right. Girl does her thing. Let's do <laughs> Boom, boom, <laughs> boom. Oh my goodness. Goodbye. <laughs> Everything is dead. Whee! Everything is dead. What can we say? She's good at her job. Yeah. She that's yep, that was a massacre. So now Eric needs to rebuild here. Lost all of his creature lands, his animated lands. Still at a healthy 20 life here. And then this is at 8. Has he done anything with the Tamio yet? I'm not sure. I couldn't quite tell at the beginning of his turn if that was Tamio activation. Because maybe he didn't go for it because he knew about Commander Dreadhorde. But now it's possible he could consider using Tamiyo to name Commander Dreadhorde to get back all the other things. All right, first things first, it's going to be a Jade Light Ranger here. Finds a Wild Growth Walker and a land. Wild Growth Walker into the yard where as soon as he can find Command the Dreadhorde, so it's much better. So he played out the Jade Light Ranger here first to increase the chance of him hitting the Commander Dreadhorde. Because you play the J Light Ranger, you get to look at the top two cards. If it's not Commander Dreadhorde, you can just put him you can put him into your graveyard. With Nissa in play, he still had the mana to cast Commander Dreadhorde if he oh, found wow. it. So this is this is what the best players do, always putting themselves in the best position um, to play to their outs. No finding that Command the Dreadhorde yet though for Efro. Javier, however, at five life, so Commander Dreadhorde, not great. Not, not too impressive. Not great. He does have the Bond of Flourishing, which could pad his life total a little bit. He's got the two copies of Interplanar Beacon in play as well, uh, which you can use to gain some life if he plays some Planeswalkers. So Nissa here continuing to take up, makes a 3-3 three, three with that Force, and a Paradise Druid is to play. Interplanar Beacon, the draw here for Dominguez. I wonder if there's another Massacre Girl anywhere. Oh no, he can't even he can't even reanimate it because he's at five. Although he could use the Bond of Flourishing to gain life and go back up to eight. And you know, part of the reason why these games also take longer is what the heck do you name with Tamio, right? You're just yeah, like, all right, I, uh, I guess uh, 
how many cards are in my grave? Now you have to do a count of like how many cards you milled into your graveyard. What's the likelihood of you finding, you know, a, a three of in your deck versus a two of? What's more important? There's just a lot of things that you have to go go through in your head when you're when you're naming cards off Tamiyo, Collector of Tales. Yeah, there's one Massacre Girl in the yard, Command the Dreadhorde on top, of course, and also one in hand for Javier here. But this game has been a, a great example of just how tricky this deck can be to play, but how rewarding. Right. Massacre Girl hitting the red zone here at Nyssa. Yeah, and I think for, uh, Ifro just uh, actually still doing a pretty good job here surviving a commanded dread horde because he got that early nissa in play and just put enough pressure on javier's life total that he couldn't his commanded dread horde really just wasn't all that impressive nissa goes down to five after that attack from massacre girl who does have menace by the way here's a minus from tamio Ooh, and we're gonna see okay massacre girl <laughs> do it again Massacre Girl number two. Only one will live to see the day, but on her way out, we'll clear up Efro's board. Yeah, that'll clean up everything, and Javier has access to Bond of Flourishing, which you can play at instant speed, by the way, That's again, right. with Teferi's plus one ability. So now Efro's on the back foot, I think. He's run out of th really threats here. He really needs to hit Command the Dreadhorde off this Tamiyo. Hit. Does he hit? I mean, how many cards does he have left? He has I know, to hit he's now. Hit. There, there it is. It is. <laughs> he missed it so many times. I assume Eric's going to win here, but... <laughs> 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 yeah, it is a bit complicated. Let's find out what happens. By the way, Eric at 22 life, so plenty of room to play with here on what he chooses to get back from the graveyard. Yeah, oftentimes it feels to me like the first person to play... Commander Dreadhorde often ends up on top, which it wasn't necessarily the case here because no. uh, Eric put on a lot of pressure. But because you are able to take the best threats out of the graveyard first, that's what it seems like the matchup comes down to. Let's see what's left over after Dominguez had his first command, the Dreadhorde, taking a look here at what he's choosing. And yeah, he's getting back multiple Wild Growth Walkers. He's going to be at Lots and lots of life. I'm not even going to do the math here because we, we don't, I mean, he's at 22 life. He can get back something like seven permanents here at least. Yep, and seven it is, as we see there from Smith Seven off this command, the Dread Horde. Oh, and look at all these triggers. I mean, you said you, you, you like the Massacre Girl yeah. triggers? Look at this one. That's four it. Jade Light Rangers. This is so disgusting. That's Those six life. No, 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 no. Sorry. That's 12 life per Jade Light Ranger, right? <laughs> Two explorers, each Jade Light Ranger. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so, so Efro is going to gain 48 life this turn. Oh my God! 48. And he's taken out all of this stuff from the graveyards. By the way, if Javier even had a thought of playing his own command, the Dread Horde, which wouldn't be even that impressive because of seven life, as we right. said. Look at this, and not even. I mean, 51 life. 51 life. Not bad. Not bad. I'm going to go with not bad on that one. And we're going to animate here again with Nissa plus Deferi. <laughs> and Javier has seen quite enough, thank you, and concedes. And that is Eric Froelich taking game number one in spectacular fashion. I think that's why I like this deck. It's just It just puts on such a great show. You know my favorite thing about, you know why I think there's that one of Bond of Flourishing in the deck? What? I think it's the easiest card to sideboard out. <laughs> so, so Sometimes you just need to make like, the decision. Right, what, what the heck do I take out? Well, there's this <laughs> random Bond of Flourishing in my deck, so I guess I'll take that one out. Uh, no, but, you know, it does legitimately have a place here. It does help you fix your mana. And against, the cr like, the burn decks, that ge that three life is very, very relevant. Taking a look here at sideboarding for Javier Dominguez, who, again, is playing the four-color Dreadhorde version of this deck. We're going to take out, we're going to trim it to Fairy here. I'm interested to see if he wants that ma He's still going to keep in one Masker Girl. And it looks like he's boarding in some copies of the rest. I mean, much of the deck is creatures, but there's a good number of Planeswalkers, and it is important for you to be able to duress Command the Dreadhorde. However, Tamiyo is really good against hand disruption, yeah. right? Tamiyo Static actually prevents you from having anything discarded. And also, even if you do duress the Command the Dreadhorde, if you draw Tamiyo, you can always just get back Command the Dreadhorde with it. Javier here, happy with his sideboard submits. Efro's already submitted, and here we go. Game number two. Sultai Dreadhorde versus Four Color Dreadhorde. 
Javier on the play, likes the hand. Yeah, solid opener. He can just run out, lead with Woodland Cemetery to play out a turn two Paradise Druid. And Eric with the classic Wild yep. Walker into J Light Ranger. I'm sure we've seen our fair share of that already. And it's nice, too, to have the insurance plan of this Wild Growth Walker Ranger package or whatever, not only to buffer your life total, but even if your opponents who aren't playing some degenerate nonsense like Dreadhorde deal with it, you really don't care because you just are able to reanimate and get stuff back so easily. That's <laughs> so interesting, actually. Ephro drew the one card that made him not play Wild Growth Walker, and that was <laughs> Llanowar Elves, because now if he plays Llanowar Elves, turn three, he can run out of Tamiyo here, and it's not really in danger of dying. And then on the following turn, he'll have access to five mana, meaning he can go Wild Growth Walker into J Light Ranger while also still preserving that Tamiyo. Paradise Druid and J Light Ranger on the table here for Dominguez. Back over to Frolic. And just as you said, we're going to see Tamiyo here. Taking up. Curious to see what he names. He already has a Commander Dreadhorde in hand. Might still name one, anyways. Ooh, the Elder Spell. Oh, okay. I like it. How many did he have in his sideboard? I, I don't... Let's take a look here. And he he has two, two Elder Spells. Two Elder Spells, okay. As does uh, Javier. Vraska Golgari Queen hits the table for Javier. And <laughs> Jade Light Ranger <laughs> hits Tamio, and there it is. Yeah, and there is the Elder Spell. Though I don't think he's going to use it now because Vraska's effectiveness is mostly uh, gone at this point because it did get a creature. I wonder, so this is interesting because Ifro can choose to tick up Tamiyo to continue to fill his graveyard. On the flip side, he can minus it to get back Llanowar Elf so that next turn he can guarantee to cast uh, a Command of Dreadhorde. Looking for the Elder spell again, ostensibly that turn with Tamiyo. Here comes Jade Light Ranger for Ifro. Probably binning that. Yep, Paradise Druid into the yard. Makes his land drop for turn and back over to Javier Dominguez. And Javier just wants to find some lands here. He wants to get closer to that Liliana Dreadhorde General. Doesn't need a second Tamiyo. Jade Light Ranger considering an attack here on Tamiyo. Uh, yeah, it's probably going to... We're, we're definitely seeing a trade here of Jade Light Rangers. And then Javier should be playing out this Paradise Druid. Doesn't have the mana to cast the Elder Spell here off the Interplanar Beacon. Yeah, Interplanar Beacon, great for your Planeswalkers. Sometimes not so great for your spells. Yeah, not good for casting magic cards that's not Planeswalkers, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> All right, Eric Froelich's turn up at bat here. I'm very curious to see what Eric is going to do with this Tamiyo. You know, what is he going to name? Is he going to get something back? He does have the ability to command the Dreadhorde this turn. But one thing that Eric has to be mindful of, too, is just it's very possible that that Javier has his own command the Dreadhorde, right? Right, exactly. Nurse, that's reversal? And he hits it? Oh, and you know, I, <gasps> lo I love that. I love that. That's so strong because he's aware of the fact that Javier now is at that six mana break point where he could he could cast a command the Dreadhorde. So now Ifro, because he is has the inability to play his own, he needs to protect himself for a command the Dreadhorde from Javier's side. So really, really heads up again. I mean, this is just, this is what happens when you see Masters play this game. He, he names the card that he needs. Of course, it's a little bit fortunate to still hit the card. Yeah. But still, you're but naming still, the right cards every time. It was correct. Time. Okay, let's scoot back over to Javier Dominguez here, who's going to kick things off with a Wild Growth Walker, j -Led Ranger situation. Druid into the yard, and there's a command, the Dreadhort. Probably keeping that one on top. Oh, yes. Maybe he's thinking about it. If Eric has his own Commander Dreadhorde, it wouldn't be very good. Oh, wow, and he bins it. Okay. Decides he doesn't want that there. Takes a peek at Ephro's graveyard anyway. Vraska here. Ooh, so, but if he loses Vraska, now Eric can get it back. See, yeah. so, so you saw him yep. slow down there. Yep. Because if he uses the Vraska to get the Wild Growth Walker, well, if Eric just has Commander Dreadhorde in hand, he can just play it and get all GG. the Planeswalkers back. Yep.
So this is a pretty tough spot because Javier, Javier is aware that Eric next turn will have land number six. And he goes, okay, this thing's probably gonna get me. How do I, how do I mitigate the damage as much as possible? And he's like, I think the best way is just to hope that he doesn't have it. Yep, so That's here he goes, crossing his fingers, attacking Tamio. She goes down, but we all know Eric Froelich does in fact have Command the Dreadhorde here and it's gonna be huge. Casting a Command of Dread Horde at 20 life just has to be just an amazing <laughs> feeling, you know? It's the greatest. Just getting back all the things. I'll take this yeah. and I'll take this. Wild Growth Walker gave me my life back, some Branch Walkers. Yeah, yeah Jade Light Ranger. And this is the that? combination, by the way, too. He has, he's going to get back Wild Growth Walker with all the Explorer creatures. Yep. He can get back some Planeswalkers here as well. If he gets back Tamio, he can then Tamio minus yep. to get kind of back. loop it and get the Command of Dread Horde back. Also, Land War Elves are really nice to get back. It only You only lose one life, yep. and you're getting the Might Land War well. Elf back, so you have access to a ton of mana next turn as well. And here oh, we go! One. <laughs> but, but, but wait, there's more! <laughs> Taking himself down to one life, that's the way we do it with Command the Dread Horde and a bunch of triggers off this Wild Growth Walker and all of these Jade Light Rangers. <laughs> and now he's going to go back up to 16 life here. That's five Explore Triggers. Every Explore Trigger will gain you three life with that Wild Growth Walker in play. And he also has picked up a nice Tamio, a nice shiny new Tamio, and a Vraska Golgari Queen. Yeah, Javier taking a look at his now sad empty graveyard. Yeah, and at this point, Javier just, uh, sorry, Eric trying to just, um, you know, mess with Javier's mana so he can't just have some explosive turns here. Back over to Javier, watery grave. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, not a whole lot here for Javier. I mean, you know, uh, the, the Liliana is like the thing that he can do here. I, I guess he can kind of hope with that he plays a Liliana, makes a creature, survives next turn, then Elder spells away the two Planeswalkers, and then maybe try to ultimate the Liliana Dreadhorde General. You could say Liliana's his last hope here. Wink. <laughs> that wasn't bad, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Yeah, that wasn't bad. All right, so Liliana here, Javier deciding which mode he wants to do. And he's going to make a 2-2 zombie creature token, pass the turn back over to Ifro. But er Eric just has everything, right? Yep. He has the Elder spell here just to get that Liliana off the battlefield, a huge board, and just uh, far more cards in hand on top of that. Eric Froelich firmly in the driver's seat here in this Dreadhorde on Dreadhorde mirror, despite the fact that he's having a mirror in essence, but not in reality, as Frolix is playing the Sultai version to the four-color version brought by Dominguez. Yeah, and that does allow him to play cards like Narset's re Reversal, which is a very difficult to cast spell in the four-color version because you're oh, playing yes. cards like the Interplanar Beacon and you need additional white sources. And uh, Narset's Reversal is very, very strong against Command the Dreadhorde. I mean, Eric, I mean... I mean, it, it feels like he was already one step ahead. Yeah, definitely. It felt like he identified that four-color Dreadhorde was going to be a popular deck this week, and then he next-leveled it by playing this version, which has better mana. It has access to Narcissus Reversal, which basically is counter yours, resolve mine, yep. and I win. And I win. Wow, great stuff here from Eric this week. Vraska uh, minusing there on the Wild Growth Walker from Javier. Deciding on some attacks here, and it's going to be everybody except this Llanowar Elves. Yeah, Eric doesn't really care too much about his life total here. If he does lose a bunch of the Explorer creatures, he can just it's cast fine. Command the Dreadhorde yep. again, get them all back, and gain the life again. Yeah, this is an impossible situation here for Javier, unfortunately. And if you notice there, Eric killed that Wild Growth Walker. So next, so when he fires off his Command the Dreadhorde, he can get back that Wild Growth Walker. Then he'll have two in play with all the Explorer creatures to just gain all of the life. Kill yours, I get it back. <laughs> oh, Javier, oh. It's like, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm done with this, but I'm going to stay here and play it out a little longer. I feel I feel for you, buddy. <laughs> and here we go. Command the dread. Meanwhile, Lord. on the other side. Yes, meanwhile, someone's having the best day of their life. <laughs> oh, even the uh, anxiety shuffle here <laughs> from Javier. Looks like we're going to choose five permanents here on this command, the Dreadhorde. Oh, man. Down to two. Triggers. How many explorers do we have this time? <laughs> Elder Spell staying on top. Wild Growth Walker goes to town. It's enormous. 
You know, I will say this: if you're um, if you're gonna take this to a tournament, you better bring a huge notebook. I don't know. With you I'm to keep track of your life total changing. All <laughs> I'm the time, serious. This right? is like really complicated. And, and, and a giant bag of dice. Oh yeah. Get all these counters. I don't. I I honestly don't think I could play this deck in real life. It'd just be too much for me. And that should do it here. Javier doesn't have a whole lot. Eric has a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of analysis they pay you the big that's, bucks that, for, that's, Paul. That's, that's why I'm here, folks. <laughs> well, Javier, I mean, I got to give him credit hanging on this long after nearly pressing concede there and, in fact, pressing it now. Eric Frolik, two games to zero over Javier Dominguez with Sultai Dreadhorde. Very impressively predicting the future from Efro. Beautifully done, knowing just what the metagame would bring and knowing what to bring to combat it was very impressive. Now, we're almost done with our day here, friends, which is very sad. I know. But there are a few other matches that we want to take a look at in the Pearl Division, and soon we're going to hop over and do that. But th that was just so incredible, seeing the live total just tick up and up and up and up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I just want to highlight, not only did I, do I think that Eric brought a fantastic deck to, to this week, you know, kind of realizing w what people were going to bring and then just trying to do, do the next level thing. But on top of that, um, just the way that he played that Absolutely. first game, putting himself in situations where he's like, look, th mathematically, I need to do, I need to sequence things a certain way to give myself the best chance of hitting that Command the Dreadhorde. And he did it time and time again, where, you know, often people would look at what he did and go, hey, that, that was weird. Why, why would you play a Crassus for just five and not yeah. the full amount? Why would you do this? Why would you do that? And it was because he was playing to try his best to put himself in a position to draw that Command With the With a new Horde. deck, playing it at that level. Exactly. And he did the same thing in game two, where he's like, look, I can't beat Commander Dreadhorde here. I need to name Tamio. Uh, with Tamio, I need to name Narset's Reversal because if Javier untaps and plays Commander Dreadhorde, I'm probably going to lose that game. Yeah, and we saw, I'm sure we're all going to go home and practice that ourselves, but right now we have Rich Hagen, one of the best riders we've got, to tell you about the Pearl Division. Hello everyone, Rich Hagen here, welcoming you to the speedy roundup of the Pearl Division in week 3 of the MPL. Let's start with Eric Froelich at 4-0 against Li Shi Chan at 1-2. While well, History of Benali was key to Game 1 with LST building out a dominant board, Laurian Enforcer tapped down Hydroid Crisis, and even with the desperate Lanoir Elves block, Froelich was down to 2 and holding nothing but 3 copies of Commander Dreadhorde, he conceded the opener, 1-0 to Lee. Want to see some Command the Dreadhorde action? Well, here we go. Frolic looks a long way behind, but Command gets him Wildgrowth Walker, two Jade Light Rangers, and a Murpho Branch Walker. That's a 6-8 Wildgrowth Walker. Lee still had an enormous board, and it required a second Command the Dreadhorde, this one even more disgusting than the first. That is 48 points of power on Frolic's side of the board, and it was 1-1. The decider came down to a spell that never got cast. Off Merfolk Branchwalker, Frolic saw Ritual of Soot on top of his library. He left it there, knowing he couldn't yet cast it and would need an extra turn to get it online. Lee didn't give him that turn. His last card in hand was Conclave Tribunal, clearing the way for an exactly lethal attack, and Lee took the match 2-1. to one. On we go to Javier Dominguez at 2-2 two two with 4 color Dreadhorde against Shahar Shenhar, winless with Azorius Aggro. Massacre Girl was central to Game 1, twice. Shenhar established a solid board and hit Dominguez hard, pushing him down to 8 life, before Massacre Girl, powered out a turn early by Paradise Druid, wiped the board clean. Apart from the blood, obviously, I mean, there was a lot of blood. Undeterred, Shenhar began to rebuild thanks to Adanto the first fort. He added a venerated Loxodon, and this time, Dominguez didn't have the fifth mana he needed for the second Massacre Girl stuck in his hand, 1-0 to Shenhar. As one-two punches go, Tamio, Collector of Tales, and Vraska Golgari Queen are quite something, which Dominguez demonstrated in Game 2. We could have chosen any number of absurd interactions between these two, but the best saw Dominguez minus Vraska to kill a Banalish Marshal. That meant a dead Vraska too. Oh well, never mind, here's Tamio returning Vraska from the graveyard. Dominguez casts Vraska again, minusing to kill the other Banalish Marshal. And never mind, yes, Tamio's gone, but here's another one. Go get a Merfolk Branch Walker with a plus ability. Disgusting. 1-1. One, one. We haven't seen much of Gideon Blackblade in the MPL so far, but Shenhar had him in Game 3, but it was dealt with handily by Dominguez over a couple of attack steps. When he went for Tamio Collector of Tales, he found Shenhar waiting with Disdainful Stroke. 
Dominguez board was still impressive though, and history banalia wasn't enough for Shenha. Teferi Time Raveler and Tamio Collector of Tales improved Dominguez's position with his draw steps just being more powerful, which is what you'd expect against a small creature strategy. And he ran out a comfortable winner, taking him to 3 and 2 and Shenha to a winless 0 and 4. What about Brian Brown doing 3 and 1 against Luis Salvato 0 and 3, Esper Midrange against Esper Control? Well, BBD was well ahead in game one when Salvato wiped the board on BBD's turn with Kaya's Wrath, thanks to Teferi Time Raveler. But Sorin, Ventral Bloodlord, returned Hero Precinct 1 to play, BBD followed up with Thief of Sanity, and suddenly there was five power on the battlefield moments after the Wrath. Salvato fought back, and Teferi Hero of Dominaria looked like it could turn the game around but BBD found Ugin the Ineffable off the top to kill Teferi, and between them, Ugin and Sorin took care of the game for BBD. There wasn't much in truth to game number two. Savato opened with a mulligan to five, and was quickly down to one card in hand against a huge clutch full of goodies for BBD. Narsip, Partra of Veils, and Ugin the Ineffable were joined by Sorin, Ventral Bloodlord, and that was pretty much that. BBD assembled a huge army unopposed and completed an excellent week, winning both his matches, and he sits tied for the lead at 4 and 1. On we go to Salvato, now at 0 and 4, against John Rolfe with his Jeskai Walkers deck. Well, could Salvato claim a first victory in the MPL against Rolfe's Jeskai Walkers? He took the opener, but Rolfe fought back, ensuring the match would, um, drag on thanks to Sark and the Masterless. Game 3 was all about Planeswalkers. There was Narset for Rolf, Narset for Salvato, Teferi Time Raveler for Rolf, the Elder Spell for Salvato, bye bye, Teferi Hero of Dominaria for Rolf and Sark and the Masterless before Teferi Hero of Dominaria and Teferi Time Raveler and Narset Parter of Veils all for Salvato. And that was enough to take the match by 2 to 1 and secure Salvato's first win in the MPL. Next up, it's Li Shi Chan at 2 and 2 against Shahar Shenha at 0 and 4. Could Shenha get his first MPL victory here? He was ahead in game 1, and the critical moment came when Conclave Tribunal took out Li's Banalish Marshal, leaving no good blocks. A turn later, Li conceded. Conclave Tribunal was also a difference maker in Game 2. Once again, Banalish Marshal was the victim, and once again, Lee was faced with horrible blocks to make. Lee fought back with Deputy of Detention, taking out a pair of Snubhorn sentries, but Shenha replied with two venerated Loxodon and took the match by 2 to 0. So, there's one more result to ring you John Rolfe's Jess Skywalkers defeating Andrew Cuneo's Bant midrange. 2 to 0. And that wraps up the story of another double dual week here in the Pearl Division, which, as Corbin knows, is the best division in the MPL. Great recap there from Rich. And uh, looks like a pretty good week for Salvato and Shahar. We saw losses there, but they both got their first win. Yeah, I mean, this means that maybe they're not 100% dead yet. Shahar just really needed a little bit of that confidence boost because, you know, he was playing the deck that, uh, you know, some of his teammates were playing, Huey and Reed Duke, also on Azorius Aggro. And Azorius Aggro just has been one of the best decks. But I, th I think the thing that I really want to talk about is just the just the multiple levels of preparation coming into this event. Oh, right? absolutely. Because, you know, we had a lot of people bringing Bant midrange last week. So everybody was like, okay, time to go into the tank, figure out what's good against Bant midrange. And I think a lot of people were like, okay, you know what? I think this four color dread horde deck, that's where it's at. That's what I'm going to play. And then people were like, wait a second. Everybody else is going to do that. <laughs> How do I go on top of that? And then we saw the Japanese bringing, you know, this land destruction strategy because it doesn't play basic lands. And then we also saw Eric just choosing to play a salt high version with just more answers for that matchup. And just, I mean, it's just fascinating to see when you see the best players just go multiple levels beyond each other to ha make all these adaptations week after week. I mean, imagine, just look at how much the metagame has changed over the last three weeks. I mean, it, you blink and you miss it, Paul. Like, right. you, you're already on to the next thing. And two, also to add on to your point, we get a little insight into the testing of these players in the MPL too, because now we see the three Japanese players all showing up with the same deck. What does that mean? We see a few players kind of shifting back and forth on Azorius and Eric Frolik, known for doing his own thing, doing his own thing to great success here this week. Yeah, and alternative Alternatively, you can also just be Martin Yuza and Seth Manfield and just <laughs> yeah. submit Mono Red every time and just get there that way. So, you know, there's a lot of different things going on here. And Mono Red, I mean, especially this week, it was a very strong choice. I mean, it's already a very good deck, but I think specifically in a field where there is a lot of Dread Horde going around, it is pretty well situated uh, for this metagame. Are we going to see more linear decks next week or are we going to see more nonsense, Paul? Well, who knows, right? Because, of course, 
the one thing that you can start out with by saying is, okay, I'm going to play mono red or salt eye, right? I'm going to play mono red because I think I'm going to be good against Dreadhorde. But then if people go, well, you know, that next week I'm going to see a lot of mono red, then you might shift gears and play Esper mid range, which, ha which has access to, you know, Moment of Craving, Oath of Kaya, Enter the God Eternals. So it, it's, it, again, I th give there's up. This huge, yeah, there's this <laughs> I'm just huge, gonna play what I, I like. Mean, that's often what happens when you know we tested for Mythic Championships yeah. in the past, where we would have this grid, this matrix of decks we It looks we like were somebody expecting. figuring out a murder right, on the right, wall. Right, right, right. It's like okay, this is good against this. This is good against that. He's gonna bring this probably, so I should bring that. And and then at the end of the day, ultimately, you know, at some point, it's just I'm gonna choose whatever deck I like to play, and then just hope it ho hope yeah. it pans out. But Absolutely. I think right now. It, it, truly fascinating, you know, just to see how the meta has kind of developed. Yeah, and I bet we see even less of just those last few um, the Azorius aggro decks hanging in there. <laughs> Let's jump over to our standings. This is the Pearl Division again. And Brian Brownduin and Eric Froelich of Forum One doing very well. Yeah, and we have, of course, Shahar and Luis uh, not doing as well. Luis, actually, you know, one of the main proponents of. of bringing Esper control every single time. And right now, I just I just don't yeah. think it's very well positioned with all these Planeswalkers. You just have to have the right answers line up at all times. And it's just really, really difficult as a control deck. Um, but yeah, Eric Froelich, I mean, again, just very impressed. You know, he, he went one and one this week, I believe. But yeah, that's also to, to prove that, you know, aggressive strategies, if you're just aggro, you can just beat any of the decks, right? right? Because, you know, decks are trying to do all these fancy things, but sometimes you have a bunch of Commander Dreadhorns in your hand. You can't really do a whole lot more. I, I think Froelich uh, had two this week because we saw him beat uh, Javier Dominguez, and then uh, I believe in the recap he beat Shahar Shinhar uh, against that Azorius. Yeah, I, I, I'm not exactly. Sure. I thought he might have lost to Lishi Tian playing Azorius, but ah, maybe but, so. but but regardless, uh, you know, I, I think. Yeah, the aggressive matchups just have the ability to punish those Commander Dreadhorde decks because, you know, some planes, like Tamiyo, for example, isn't especially good if your opponent's beating you down. No. Also, <laughs> Commander Dreadhorde, not very good if your opponents are beating you down. You really have to rely heavily on that Wild Growth Walker traditional Sultai mid-range package to kind of get you to that late game. Right. But anybody's game yet, Paul. Yeah. It just yep. sure is. And now is the moment we promised you. We promised there would be a Modern Horizons card preview, and that's what we have for you right now. There she is. Paul, talk us through this card. All right, well, Sword of Sinew and Steel. This is sword number seven that's existed. Awesome. We have, of course, five of the enemy colored swords. Uh, and now we had the Azorius sword uh, previewed re uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before. And now we have this one. And I think this one has a chance. Uh, you know, it, the, the metagame has to break in the proper fashion, but protection from black and red is very, very powerful because decks like Jund and decks like Grixis Death Shadow have a lot of removal spells that are black and red. Cards like Fatal Push and Lightning Bolt. And, you know, if you look at the text here as well, the fact that you can deal combat damage to a player and kill Planeswalkers or Artifacts is also also very relevant in modern. Tons of artifacts being played in modern. And of course, now you don't have to make that awkward decision of do I attack my opponent or do I attack right. you know, Planeswalker? You just get both. And this is really cool too because it's a blast from the past. And I know we've already seen one sword, but it's got such a special place, the swords and players' hearts from over the years. Yeah, yeah. People people love them a sword. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what people choose to do with this. And of course, if you ever open it in uh, one of your limited matches. Woo! <laughs> that's, that's just, slam that just thing slam down. It down. Slam it down. Very, very <laughs> cool. And it's my first card preview. Oh yeah. Well, hopefully <laughs> the first of many. <gasps> Congratulations. You got a you got a nice one. You got a mythic one to start Front out. So. Mm -hmm. Started from the top. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much to everybody at home. Make sure that you tune in next week. We will have we'll be back with another episode of MPL Weekly. That's going to be at 12 PDT Pacific Daylight Time. And don't forget that the Mythic Championship, a uh, thousand people, uh, over uh, almost 4,000 people are going to go down to 128 tonight. And then tomorrow, that 128 are going to turn into 16 that are going to go to the Arena Mythic Championship 3. So that's going to be very exciting. Make sure you click around on the Twitch to find out uh, and watch those matches go down. Thanks so much to Paul and Maria for being here. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And thanks so much to you at home for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.